Tim's going to do welcome and announce a couple things. Anyway, and then so uh, when uh, Tim gets done, he'll sing another song. And then Clint is going to get up and do a song. And then when he gets done, he'll come up and just uh, mention the offer. Hey, Rachel. You don't have to go, you know, check. They know about this. Make sure they know the best. Let's turn to you, I guess. Unless you want them to see the lyrics. I want these guys to see the lyrics. Okay. It's just I think it'll be in there just to show you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's one we're going to be doing pretty soon. But it's just like this. We weren't ready to do it. Okay.
10,000 years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first began Some time now since the property that we had in Dallas sold, we've had that money, and then of course with dealing with everything with the pandemic and all that, it's kind of slowed us a little bit. But recently, a couple things have happened. One is we hired a company uh, to go out that's going to be doing some work on our property out on 987. For those of you who are new, we have 13 acres out FM 987, about uh, just past the South Bend development out here that. Uh, the church acquired several years ago it's been sitting dormant now uh, that we are looking to uh, put a new facility on um, and so uh, we're going to have someone out there they're going to be doing some work there to clear that and do and get some site uh, the first part of the site ready uh, the second thing is we've selected an architect uh, that is going to come in tuesday uh, horace grow is our resident architect uh, here that's worked for wickliffe uh, translators in the architectural business for many years. Of course, kind of leading that charge as part of what we're doing, and he's going to meet with that architect, get everything signed up. And then the next order of business is going to be to do an initial drawing of what the facilities would look like. This is for our new uh, worship facility for everything to do with the church and the school. So once we get uh, those drawings put together, um, then we will be in a position to where we can go out and uh, get bids on the, the uh, facilities from different uh, contractors uh, and see what we're looking at in terms of, it's, it's kind of a moving target recently in terms of trying to, trying to figure out how much it's going to cost. So we'll be able to get a, uh, some actual hard numbers on what it would be, look like and then we'll then come back and do an assessment of how much we have in resources and how much more we'll need and there'll be more to come on that discussion as we do that. So that's that's where things are as we do, uh, we are now. So uh, we're, we're really excited about it, we're, uh, and we hope you are too. Uh, and as we move through the coming months, I, I, I don't have a timeline on when to expect that draw, those drawings, but I would expect that, that uh, you know, maybe uh, towards the end of this year, the first of next year, we'll be, be able in a position to start looking at that, okay? All right, so thanks for everybody and be in prayer about that. In fact, let me close in prayer as we talk about this. Lord, thank you, uh, God, that you have seen fit to allow us to have property uh, that we might be able to build on. God, that you brought, um, uh, you, you've done marvelous things in bringing resources to us uh, from outside that had nothing to do with anything except your hand moving in the hearts of people. Uh, God, we, we ask as we move through this time, God, that we would be a people that would just seek your will, whatever it may be, however it may be, and the timing of what it may be. Uh, God, that we will be before you and we will have the one thing in, that, uh, in mind, and that is to glorify you and move your kingdom forward. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. It's uh, time for our uh, missionary focus and our uh, prayer together as a body. Uh, I want to remind you to pray for.
for uh, Mike Wilson and his family this week. Uh, and remember to keep uh, Ursula's dad uh, and the rest of the family in, in the prayers as well. Uh, our missionary focus also, uh, we're not passing around plates for the offering still uh, because of the COVID, but we do have boxes in the back and uh, it's really easy to give online if you go to the church website and just click on the give button. So our missionary focus this week is Sela Creek and uh, they are a home for uh, mainly for young mothers with either small children or expecting uh, that have no other place to go. Some of them have come out of uh, incarceration or they've been kicked out of their homes and I, I reached out to Ashley on Saturday uh, via text and uh, she sent me a text back that I'd like to read to you real quick. I guess I can take that off. She says, uh, it's actually perfect timing for prayer. We are struggling. We have two mamas right now and have had to shut our home down temporarily due to COVID. Every person in the home has been diagnosed with COVID or has symptoms. Thankfully, one of our high-risk mamas is in the hospital, so she's safe. Thank God for that. Will you guys please pray that COVID would move quickly with minimal symptoms? Other than that, we are good, and as soon as we are COVID-free, we will begin accepting more residents. So, um, obviously, when somebody uh, starts off saying we're struggling, uh, they're in need of, of our prayer. And, uh, I know that's hard on them because they... Uh, they were seeing such a huge uh, influx of calls and uh, people wanting uh, to get in and not being able to do that, I know, uh, hurts their hearts. Uh, also, uh, in your bulletins, Mary Peterson is in there at the top, and a little bit of update on her. She actually broke her arm and her pelvis uh, when she fell. And she's back home right now. She didn't have the deep vein thrombosis that uh, they thought she did, but she does have a superficial long thrombosis, which uh, just a, kind of a long blood clot on her skin, and she's uh, changed to some oral medications for that, a blood thinner, so uh, they want us to pray that that would work, uh, you know, pray that her strength would return, and uh, that she could, uh, because of her pelvis, she's wheelchair bound right now, pretty much, or in the bed, and uh, just want us to pray that uh, she would be able to get out of the wheelchair sooner rather than later. Uh, they have some praises. Uh, they had a lot of friends and uh, expatriates over there that came and uh, moved their entire house around pretty much uh, just to make a path for Mary to be able to get around better. Uh, so just want to pray for their overall health. Also, Nancy's had to take on a lot more physical duties than she normally does, so we want to pray to strengthen her and uplift her as well. Um, Loretta Williamson, Lori West's mom, I found out she wasn't qualified for a lung transplant, uh, but the doctors are working on uh, different medications to treat her pulmonary fibrosis, uh, her COPD, and some heart problems she's having, and they're also, uh, they have a heart doctor that's looking into doing uh, or the possibility of doing a uh, heart surgery and that has to happen before they can make any decisions about the lung transplant going forward. Uh, so we just want to pray that uh, the doctors uh, have the wisdom to make these new medications, pick the right ones that'll uh, relieve some of her symptoms and uh, just make her more comfortable. Also, uh, friend of the rights, Richard Couch, uh, has been going, uh, undergoing treatment for cancer. A uh, tumor on his pancreas has actually shrank, so that was a praise, uh, but there's one on his liver that's actually grown, uh, so they're attacking that with radiation, and I just want to pray that uh, that tumor would shrink and that there would be total healing uh, in his body as well. So let's uh, just take a few moments to lift all these people up in prayer and then I'll close this.
Heavenly Father, we uh, do lift up uh, Selah Creek to you. Uh, you know they're struggling uh, just with uh, COVID in general, Father, and they've had to shut down their ministry uh, temporarily. Uh, Father, we do pray that uh, there will be uh, minimal symptoms in the house and that they can uh, return to normal operation uh, soon, Father that they would uh, be able to allow residents to come again. Uh, we also lift up Mary and Nancy, Father. I uh, just pray for strength for both of them. Uh, healing in Mary's body, Father, uh, that you would uh, just heal her bones and she could make a full recovery, Father, and uh, just continue uh, as she was before she fell. Uh, we thank you so much that she didn't have a, a serious blood clot, Father, that it's a superficial uh, surface clot that they feel uh, good that uh, can be resolved uh, with an oral blood thinner medication. Uh, we thank you that they have friends, Father, that uh, were glad uh, to go help them uh, just move furniture around and make uh, getting around uh, easier for Mary uh, in her wheelchair. And Father, we thank you uh, that the one tumor uh, on Richard Couch's pancreas has shrunk. And we pray that you would just uh, guide the doctors uh, as they attack this other tumor, Father. And uh, that ultimately you would just heal his body, uh, Father. Just, uh, Father, so many times uh, when we are struggling through trials or our family and friends are struggling through trials, we, uh, you know, our flesh uh, tends to make us worry and be anxious uh, father but your uh, your truth and your word uh, tell us differently father your your truth tells us that when we know you as savior that we can boldly come to you uh, father with our burdens and our anxieties father uh, when we know you as savior we can come to you in prayer uh, father when we know you as savior we can even come to you and with thanksgiving during trials, Father. When we know you as Savior, you will guard our hearts and minds in the blood of Christ, Father. And when we do all of these things, Father, you can give us the peace that surpasses all understanding uh, that only you can give, Father. So I pray that peace over uh, all our friends and uh, family that are uh, struggling in trials right now, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
King's Court. Today, possibly the most famous passage of all, Daniel chapter 6. Let's read it together. Hear the word of the Lord. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom those satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished. Above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the, pre the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction. Then whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said to the king concerning the injunction, O king! Did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then, at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, 
been able to deliver you from the king from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. I do not like listening to the same song two times in a row. I don't like repeating songs. I don't know about you. Sometimes you might accidentally push the wrong button on Spotify and you realize that you're listening to the same song again. And that happens to me. I just kind of get mad. I don't know why. It's kind of, kind of weird. But Rebecca, we can be driving somewhere, and we've got music playing in the background, and I realize, like, the very first song comes on an album again for the second time, and she's like, how many times have we heard it? I have no idea. No idea what we listen to. She can listen to things on repeat over and over and over, and that just baffles me. I can't do it. I don't like repeat. Sometimes it feels like suffering is stuck on repeat. Maybe the Groundhog Day sensation that you get during COVID. Maybe seeing a, a mounting prayer list where one jumps off and then another comes right back on. Same diseases, it seems, again and then again. Opening up your computer to the whatever website you go to for news, and it seems like the same kind of cycle of bad news. Seems that way, but is it? Is it true that suffering is stuck on repeat? Well, frankly, yeah, it is, oftentimes. Because this is a fallen world that's not getting any better, ultimately. Daniel 6 is here to show God's people that emerging from one trial, making it through, doesn't mean there won't be another one right around the corner. Which is a little disheartening, I'm not going to lie. How do we deal with that potentially depressing truth? We'll talk about that today, because sometimes suffering seems stuck on repeat. Daniel 6 seems basically like the same story that we've heard several times already in the book of Daniel. And if it seems that way, that's because really it is. These exile stories that we've had from Daniel 1 to 5, with possible exception of chapter 4, have, had, have really had the same basic structure to them. Have you noticed that? Has, has it felt maybe a little bit repetitive to you? Like, it's a, it's a little bit of a plot twist here and there, but it's pretty much the same. Kind of like you can predict what's going to happen next. You have a prideful ruler, and then you have the persecution of God's people. You have the faithfulness of God's people. You have the powerlessness of the ruler. You have the distress of the ruler. You have the threat of death. You have deliverance. The exaltation of God. The prospering of God's people. And then again, and then again. Each story that we've looked at has included most of, if not all, of those elements. And it's the same plot here. Again, in Daniel chapter 6. So my question is, as I approach this, this story, is why record one more story that seems pretty much the same, it feels pretty much the same as the previous five? Well, it's in order to highlight the key difference. The key difference between this episode and all of the previous ones. Which is that this episode happened under a new imperial regime. Look at verse 1 again. It pleased Darius... 
to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. Satraps are officials in charge of a region of the empire. And over them he set three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Now remember our context. We've been in Babylon this whole time. Right? Since the very beginning of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar dragged the people of Judah into Babylon, in exile. These are exiled people. And we've had rulers, Nebuchadnezzar. We've had Belshazzar, who ruled under Nabonidus. And then we ended chapter 5, Belshazzar's reign. Look at verse 30 of chapter 5, how it ended. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean, or Babylon, Babylonian king, was killed. Next verse, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. The Mede, it's a new kingdom, in other words. This is not Darius the Babylonian. This is Darian, Darius the Mede. Darius' identity is, is pretty uncertain. There's not a whole lot of historical record about him. A lot of people actually think that Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian were the same person. They kind of had different names depending on what day of the week it was. But the bottom line is it's a new empire that's ruling over the people of Judah. Babylon is no more. The Medes and the Persians are. But... Now it's to be the same sort of story in Daniel chapter 6. But with that key difference, there is a new government ruling. Why? In order to show what? That just because God brought his people through one trial did not mean there was not another one around the corner. That just because something had changed in their situation... For the better, even, in this case, did not mean that there wouldn't be something else similar that they might face in the near future. And it's been like this for Israel throughout Daniel so far. They faced suffering by being taken captive, suffering under the threat of death from the Babylonian Empire, suffering by being thrown into a fiery furnace, suffering of fearing for their lives as they watched the empire fall. And now this, a whole new empire, except this one has a lion's den. Brand new empire, same old problems. Chapter 6, it doesn't repeat chapter 3, the fiery furnace, although you kind of look at it and you're like, man, it seems almost exactly the same. It doesn't repeat chapter 3, it doesn't repeat the other chapters, 1, 2, 5, that have similar structures, but it does add to them. Suffering happened to Israel's leaders under Babylon. Now it happens under Persia. Deliverance from one didn't mean there wouldn't be more trouble ahead. Why? Why is that true? Because no matter what changed in Daniel's circumstances, his enemies always found a way to attack him. No matter what changed in Daniel's circumstances, his enemies always found a way to attack him. Daniel and company were put on top of the world again and again. These are the biggest empires of the world at the time, and then continually they were put on top. Things changed in those guys' positions for the better. In every single story, right? And yet every single time their enemies found a new way to try to bring them low. Let's look at the examples of how Israel was on top throughout exile. Go back to chapter 1, turn over, and we'll kind of thumb through real quickly through the, the first five chapters of Daniel. Verse 17 of chapter 1. You probably recall this happening. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. Turn over to chapter 2, verse 46, the very end of the book, or 45, no, 46, that's where we're going. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. Okay, back on top. Chapter 3, verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Goes through the whole fiery furnace thing. Promoted. 
Skip chapter 4, let's go to chapter 5, verse 29. Close to where we ended last week. It says, Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. They were put on top over and over and over again. And yet every time their enemies found a new way to bring them low. Now, here in chapter 6, Darius was just about to put Daniel on top again. Chapter 6 now, verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished. This happens before all the stuff. Usually it's at the end of the chapter. This happens before everything. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And yet, once again, his enemies schemed. Verse 4. Then the high officials and the satraps. Notice that connection, that word then, it really connects the two. Daniel was planned, he was about to be put on top. Then, or but, the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. In verse 3, Daniel was distinguished. In the very next moment, Daniel was a target to be extinguished. They came together by agreement, verse 6 says. And we'll see that phrase repeated several times throughout this chapter. By agreement, meaning they were in on this together. They were intent in what they were doing. Maybe because of jealousy. I don't really know. Maybe something else. But they have nothing on him. And that's a problem for them. The end of verse 4. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Most other translations use the term trustworthy for faithful. When we're talking about having no error or fault, we're talking about how he wasn't negligent in any of his duties. He was in no way corrupt as one of the king's officials. If, if someone was running for office today, you can imagine all the, the digging people would do for what was happening in that person's past. That they could throw out and sling some mud. They had nothing on Daniel. Dig as they may. And so when one scheme didn't work, they just moved to another one. Verse 5. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O king Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, not Daniel, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction. That whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, should be cast into the den of lions. Now, this idea that they bring to Darius was probably not about Darius being worshipped as God. That's not really what's going on here. It's probably more like Darius. They wanted, they wanted to proclaim Darius as the sole mediator between humans and all the different gods that they had for a period of 30 days. Why? Well, it, it's, it's to cloak this whole thing as a tool to weed out potential traitors in the empire. Hey, Darius, you want to figure out who's not with you? Let's make this thing, this, this edict, and you will be the one guy people can go to to pray to the gods. They were there, these satraps and prefects, to protect the king from suffering loss. We had seen that back in verse 2. Well, the king didn't reverse decisions in this empire. We don't exactly know why in the empire of the Medes and the Persians. But look at verse 8. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. These were persistent enemies. One attack didn't work. They moved on to the next. Circumstance changed for Daniel. Daniel. They found a way to turn that circumstance into some sort of trouble for him. No matter what would change in Israel's circumstances down the road, they were to know that the enemies of God's people would always find a way to attack them. Always. They would sit under new empires. They would travel to new lands, set themselves down in those. They would be given certain new freedoms under different regimes. Things would change for them, for Israel, over the generations, sometimes for the better. And yet every time their enemies would find a new way to bring them low. The nation of Israel always, always had enemies scheming against it. 
all the way up to the time of Christ. Persistent enemies that found ways to attack them, no matter what suffering they had just emerged from, or how on top they might have been in the moment. And friends, no matter where you are, who you become, what you do, where you run to, what success you have, what sufferings that you've already been through, the enemy is always looking to ruin you. New house, new spouse, new position, new whatever. Things will change for you throughout your life, but every time the enemy will find a way to attack you. You will change some things about your circumstances for the better sometimes. Some things will be changed for you in very good ways in your life, but you will still have trouble. Previous sufferings you will emerge from, and you have. God will bring you through. God has brought you through, but there will be more around the very next corner. It's like... Making it all the way through a minefield just to find out that the next step is a massive, raging, rapid river that you have to cross to get wherever you are going. Maybe you feel this more now than ever. It's exactly how it was for Daniel. Surely it seemed to Daniel and company, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who've been there with him, and the rest of Israel who... We assume some were at least remaining faithful to God. It seemed to them like suffering was stuck on repeat in their lives as exiles. Because it was. Remember the book of Job, kind of the beginning of Job, when something hits Job, someone comes and tells him, X has happened and it's been awful. And it feels like just every few minutes, someone else comes up to Job, oh, by the way, this happened. Oh, and then a few minutes later, oh, and by the way, this happened. These people are dead. These animals are dead. This has been destroyed. Suffering. Stuck on repeat. The powerlessness of King Darius. Did you notice how powerless Darius is throughout this whole ordeal? His powerlessness points us to the fact that there was something bigger behind Daniel's suffering than Darius and Darius' edict. Right? Look at verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement, there it is again, and found Daniel making petition and plea. They came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Notice they came in or by agreement. Same phrase as before. It's going to be repeated again down in verse 15. There's coordination going on here that's bigger than Darius. Darius is the king of the world, but it's bigger than him. Darius can't stop anything from happening in this story. It's crazy. Keep going in verse 12. The king answered and said, The thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you've signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed. Look, I'm distressed. What do I do? Set his mind to deliver Daniel. I'm going to figure it out. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Darius is like, I'm going to figure out a way to deliver this guy. And the very next verse says, <laughs> You can't. The thing stands fast, helpless. Darius was much distressed over the situation. He's helpless. He labored to deliver Daniel, but failed. He's helpless. And so he just gives up trying. That's verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. He declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you, because I can't. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed. 
And the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. See, the force of evil coming at Daniel was beyond Darius. It was beyond Darius. Which shows how suffering came to Daniel and these other guys throughout from all kinds of different places. It wasn't just humanity that was bringing it on them. And so, the suffering then was on repeat. Wasn't just going to hit from one angle. One door closes on their suffering, and then a window opens, and it blows right in. And with these events and the scriptures that emerged from them, the book of Daniel that was given to the Israelites throughout the generations, God was preparing Israel that for their foreseeable future, it was going to seem to them like suffering was stuck on repeat. Because it would be stuck on repeat. It would be. They would get out of exile, and then they'd face another enemy. They'd be put on top of the world, it would seem like. But then they'd be tempted in that to deny God, and God would discipline them. And then Rome would come on the scene. We'll see Rome later in this book. And Rome would get mad at the Jews' rebellion, and they would just destroy the temple. They had to see that there was something bigger behind their suffering than those human enemies. There was a driving force behind it all. And so, because of that, the suffering would be on repeat. Because even if a human regime dies, another one comes up again. It wasn't just going to hit from one angle. There would be snipers at every compass point. We just got just got through one. And now there's another. Yahweh. And in your life it will seem to you sometimes like suffering is stuck on repeat. Because it will be. Someone in your family will be healed and then someone else will get sick. The house will flood one day and the AC will break the next. One of your kids will get bullied at school and then another one will get suspended for something. 2020 seems to be the most blatant suffering cycle in recent memory. And there's something bigger. There's something bigger behind that cycle. You know that. You know that there is fallenness in the world. You know that there is an enemy with a capital E who is on the prowl. Who does not just come at you from one angle. What kind of enemy would that be? You win one victory that's straight ahead, you're like, yes, got through. You got another combatant at your six. Over and over, again and again. I just got through that, Lord. And now this. That is where Daniel was. That is where Daniel was. Now, 70 some odd years into exile. So then, the question is what was Daniel and company's response? to the cycle of suffering. What was their response? It was their own cycle of faithfulness. In the face of death, Daniel was faithful, as he and the others had already been. Already had been. Verse 19. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me. Why? Because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Blameless or innocent is what the text says. There's evidence that this whole lion's den thing was, was kind of a, a guilt test. If you can think back to like the Salem witch trials and some of the things they would do, throwing, throwing them into the water. And if they drowned, well, they were you know, guilty. If they didn't, they weren't or whatever. It's kind of the same idea here. What was going on and yet Daniel was faithful. Verse 23. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Daniel's trust in God was his faithfulness. 
It was continual throughout his life. Under threat, Daniel was faithful as he and the others had already been. The author wants us to think back to verse 10 with this. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Was it just because the edict had been signed? Do you want to stick it to him? No, it's as he had done previously. That verse right there says everything changed against Daniel's favor, but nothing changed in Daniel's relationship to God. Would have been easy to stop praying. But he prayed, the text says, toward Jerusalem. Maybe praying for a return there for his people. We want to go back there. First Kings chapter 8, God commands his people to pray, looking that direction. Because why? Well, because of what Daniel's heart was doing. God wanted their hearts to be oriented toward where he had them, toward where he wanted them to be. Daniel's heart was oriented toward Zion. The kingdom of God. His heart was not stuck in the opulence of Babylon or Persia. Such that he knew, Daniel knew, that it was much more dangerous for him to cease communing with God and interceding for his people than it was to face a pride of hungry lions. One was more dangerous than the other. Someone has said, well, the dangers we don't see are generally much greater than the dangers we do see. His praying was as he had done previously. Cycle. Daniel confronted a cycle of suffering with his own cycle of faithfulness. And it bolstered his endurance. Dale Davis says, consistency assists courage. And discipline feeds faithfulness. That's so good. Consistency assists courage. Wonder why you're afraid? Probably because you're not consistent in your faithfulness. Discipline feeds faithfulness. How would the people of Israel, reading this book of Daniel later on, opening the scroll... Be called to respond to this, their own cycle of suffering with their own cycle of faithfulness. Same thing. How often after Daniel would the prophets cry out over and over, Faithfulness! 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 Like a bride to her groom. But you would not. God saying to them, Israel, you will have trouble, but stay with me. Keep trusting me. Keep worshiping me. Things will change for the better, and then they will change for the worse. But circumstances are not to matter in regards to your relationship with me. They needed to have hearts oriented toward Jerusalem, toward, toward Zion, the kingdom of God. Not stuck in the greatness, maybe, of their current situation, when it was great, sometimes it would be, but also not stuck in the awfulness of their current situation, which oftentimes it was pretty bad. They need to recognize that it was much more dangerous for them to give up on being God's people than it was for them to be persecuted by yet another empire that may have threatened their physical bodies. The danger they wouldn't see Versus the danger they would. Which one was more dangerous? How are you called to respond to the cycle of suffering? With your own cycle of faithfulness. Over and over. Again and again. God is saying to you, you will have trouble, child. But stay with me. Trust me. Keep worshiping me. Things will change for the better. And then they'll change for the worse. But circumstances are not to matter in regards to your relationship with me. It would be easy for you, amidst the cycle, to stop praying, to stop communing with God. That's what you're tempted to do. Resist that temptation. 
Instead, orient your heart toward Zion, toward God's kingdom, toward what's to come. Don't get stuck with your eyes fixed on this good position you're in now. If that's what you're in, awesome, great. Don't get stuck with your eyes fixed on the awful one that you're in, if that's what it is. Because the dangers we don't see are generally much greater than the dangers we do see. Example. Danger I do see. It's right in front of my face. My kid's not going to make the team if they don't play in those tournaments. Cause them, to, cause them to miss church. Danger I don't see. My kid will never develop a grace-filled habit of community life and worship with the people of God if they do play over and over. Which is the greatest danger? The one that you see? Or the one that you can't yet. Our enemy's attacks aren't always through suffering, but they're also through subtle temptations. Subtle temptations. And yet Daniel's faithfulness through this one episode did not guarantee protection from another round of suffering. And neither would it for Israel. Go down, go down to verse 28. After it's all over, it says, So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Yes! Daniel is on top again! The exiles are going to go home under Cyrus the Persian, but then they're going to get ruled by other peoples. And that's what the rest of Daniel is going to be about, predicting that cycle. Neither does your faithfulness, friends, through one episode of difficulty guarantee you protection from another round of suffering. There is no vaccine that will prevent difficulties in this life. There is no immunity antibody that you can get. Just because you made it through once doesn't mean it won't happen again. Bob Fjall says the life of faith must be lived to the very end. Earlier victories and rescues cannot be taken as guarantees of absence of future crises. You'll be faithful. You'll be so faithful. And yet troubles will still come. And then come again. And when the enemy can't get you to fall, by tempting your weaknesses, praise God, when that happens... He'll just attack your strengths. As with Daniel. Chris Wright, don't guard only your weak points. Watch your strong points as well. Satan knows how to attack both. He's strong. He's wily. Sadly, Israel did not follow Daniel and company's lead into a cycle of faithfulness. The cycle of suffering got the best of them as history went on, which is why they so desperately needed Messiah to come. And neither are you or I faithful. Oh, we're not. We fail to drown out the suffering song that's on repeat with a louder song of faithfulness to God. We fail to do that. Sometimes we just throw in the towel and we say, I cannot take this anymore, God. And we lean on other things for dependence instead. People or stuff or substances. We are not Daniels. Though we strive to be, you ought to. If we're not Daniels, then how do we have hope for ultimate deliverance? That's what Daniel 6 begs us to ask. Because it sure seems like this chapter is connecting God's deliverance of Daniel with his faithfulness, right? But that's faithfulness that we obviously do not have. Where's our hope for deliverance? Well, that chapter is making that connection between God's deliverance of Daniel and his faithfulness. It is. But it is not to show you that your faithfulness will mean your deliverance from your lion's dens. It's not why. 
God did not bring Daniel through the lion's den to show you that he would deliver you from all of yours, but to show you how he would bring Jesus through his. Think of all the similarities between not you and Daniel, but between Daniel and Jesus. Just in chapter 6, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He was blameless and innocent. Jesus had people plot against him, came together by agreement to take him down. People who got the government involved because it was the only way they could figure to do it. Jesus went before a ruler who couldn't find any problems with him at all. And he wanted to let him go. But who claimed, oh, my hands are tied. I wash myself of this. I can't do anything. Jesus was sentenced to death. And then there's where one contrast comes in. Jesus died. But he was sealed in a tomb with stone, much like this pit was. And there were those who ran to that tomb at the break of day to find him alive. To find him, just like Daniel, delivered. And in that moment, all of God's enemies were rendered powerless, just like Daniel's enemies when they were cast into that den moments later. And just like Daniel, Jesus was exalted he was made to prosper such that the kingdom of the universe has been given to him. God didn't bring Daniel to the lion's den to show you that he would deliver you from all of yours, but to show you how he would bring Jesus through his. For Jesus was faithful. And because of Jesus' faithfulness, you can pin all your hopes on God's promise to you ultimate, eternal deliverance from the cycle of suffering. Guys, it is, it is God's power to save that is the star of this show. Verse 24, and the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Just in case anyone thought that these were tame lions that Daniel had spent some time with. And the same structure from the previous stories continues once again with the way it ends. Verse 25, what happens? Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever, and his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues, he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. If we've heard it once, we've heard it over and over in Daniel. Brand new empire, same old problems, same great God. Yahweh replaces yet another king as the only one to be worshipped, even in this pagan nation. What Darius was completely powerless to do, God God's power to save is the star of this show, and it is God's power that raised Jesus from the grave, and it is God's power that will one day raise you and wipe away all of your tears. When the suffering that seems to just be on repeat will not only be drowned out, not only be muted, it will be completely and utterly erased from every place. After we pray, Clark is going to come to the piano. He's going to play a song that he's going to teach us. But for today, sit, listen, soak it in. You wonder if you can stand through the cycle of suffering? You can. 
because Jesus did for you. Let's pray. Oh, what comfort, oh Lord. Because we want so badly to be Daniels. But we're not. I'm not. So we thank you, O oh Lord, that Jesus was for us. We are undeserving of that. Every time we fall, O oh God, remind us of his great faithfulness. And every time the suffering batters us with another wave, remind us of his faithfulness. Pick us up, O oh Lord, and bring us through. Cause us to endure by your goodness and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
Pray together. May the one to whom all powers, kingdoms, dominion has been given cause you to stand and endure and bring you through. It's in his mighty and powerful name we pray. Amen.
talked to me yesterday or talked to us yesterday. Looking about one place all week together. Yeah, but I texted them, and they, they need to wait and find it in the spring because they have a, a one-year lease. What are you crying about? Oh, is she missing one pin? pin?